this is the day that we remember that the Lord Jesus who died on the cross after three days came alive again. And so we say, He is risen. He is risen indeed. God in the Gospel of Mark reads thus, chapter 16, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Pray with me. Our Father in heaven, as these women got to that tomb, uh, they were beginning to realize the truth of what we celebrate today, what you did. You overcame death and sin and the grave. And you did it through the death of our Lord Jesus and the power of his indestructible life. His innocent, uh, perfect life couldn't be held by the grave. And in him we ask that you would awaken each one of us this day to the hope, even the trembling, fear-giving kind of hope that there is in the resurrection, the fact that Jesus did rise from the grave, and therefore that means something eternal for every one of us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. If you're able, we invite you to stand and sing out.
welcome. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come humbly today, rejoicing in your work. We praise you, Lord, for the resurrection of your Son. We praise you for this great victory over sin and death and the grave. Help us, to, Lord, to fully understand the great sacrifice that you made and that your son Jesus made. Help us, Lord, to come to him in repentance and humbly seeking him. Help us to live a life for him, for your honor and for your glory. Father, we thank you for this church and we thank you for all that you are doing here. Thank you for bringing this good number into your house today that we may celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection and everlasting life with him. We thank you for the work that you have done in our lives and that you are doing in the life of this church. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you, choir. Our scripture today is Romans 8, 31 through 39. If you have your Bibles and would like to turn there, and if you are able, if you would rise for the, for the reading. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. May God bless the reading of the scripture and now the preaching of it and you may be seated. One of my favorite things, <clears throat> increasingly, about Easter is what are called the taunts in Scripture. A taunt is something that you would read like in 1 Corinthians 15, where people who know Christ and Christ himself can say to the grave and to death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? Because it's gone. I love the victory taunt that is for Christians in Christ. We have something of that in the book of Romans, this amazing passage at the end of chapter 8, where because Jesus is risen from the grave, we see that we can have that kind of confidence and victory. Two things specifically, knowing that one, God is for us. God really is favoring us. And secondly, that no matter what happens, you, Christian, will ultimately triumph in Christ. Now, this is something that for many Christians, I believe, is a, a swelling, encouraging hope that rises in us once in a while on Easter when the resurrection becomes maybe more real to us, more close to us, but then it maybe fades and, and goes away. And that sense of victory, where we would taunt the grave, where we would look at the sting of death and say, where's your sting? It sort of fades because this world is full of pain. This world is, in fact, full of many kinds of difficulties. But we who gather together to hear God's word read, to, to preach it and to pray and call on God's name together, we are constantly realigning ourselves. And so this morning what I want you to do is I want you to fill your mind in such a way that this will stick with you. This knowledge of the victory that is in Christ Jesus for you. It begins in verse 31 where he says, what shall we say to these things? Now, our question should be, to what things does he refer? He's referring to the things that are mentioned just before this in the book of Romans. In chapter 8, he gives Christians a couple of realities. On the one hand, he says, God is calling people to himself. God calls people. God justifies people. And he, the people that become Christians in this world will eventually be raised like Jesus and glorified like him and with him. God will definitely do this. God begins it and God finishes it. That's one reality. The other reality that he explains is that we still have sin, chapter 7, and we still, all people, are in a world that is burdened. The world is called fallen. It is broken and groaning in sin. And he compares it to the pains of childbirth, this experience that we have in this world. So, so these two things are both true. God really loves us. He causes every detail of everything that's happening for the good of his people. And this fallen, broken world is incredibly painful. And, and creation itself is groaning because of how broken everything is. 
And so Paul says these two things are both true. Well, what should we say about that? Where does that leave us? What should we think? What should we make of our situation right now? And the first thing he says is this. He says, if God is for us, the one thing is true, who can be against us? Christian, you have to get this perspective. He's asking a question rhetorically. If God, in fact, is for us, what he's saying is, God, in fact, is for us. All who call in the name of the Lord Jesus, God is for us. That is an amazing thing. We have to let that sink in. Therefore, the second part of this, where he says, who can be against us? The point that he's making is this. It doesn't matter. If God is for us, the grave can't hold us. If God is for us, then every bad thing that we might suffer is like going through childbirth. The pain can only last for so long, but it will result in joy definitely in the end. And you, Christian, will triumph over all things that you might suffer. He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? God is sovereign. He is orchestrating all these details of our lives. And these sufferings, these groanings that we experience now, he's saying, they can't last. They will end. The reason he gives in verse 32 next is this. He says, think about this. In light of these things, and after asking, what shall we say to these things, he gives another reason. If God is for us, who can be against us? Then he says this. Think about it. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, what more could God have given? There's nothing more valuable than the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, the Father with all of his affection, all of his love for his Son, said, I'm going to give him up for you. Now think about that. And then he says this, He who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He's arguing from the greater to the lesser. God has given you the greatest gift. Do you think he won't give you lesser things? No, no. And he says, he even argues, he says, God will graciously give us all things, meaning all things that are good. God won't hold anything back from you that is good. Now, how can you be sure about this? Well, the basis of it is this. God displayed his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. God gave us his son. He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. That's what we talked about this week, the cross. He gave him as a, a sacrifice to atone for the penalty of our sin, for your sin, if you trust in Christ. I've been reading this other book, and, and I found something amazing. I want to share this with you. In the book of Exodus, Moses asks God to show him his glory, and God says his own name. And he passes before Moses, and this is what he says. You have to know who God is, his very character. There's a parable that Jesus told about one steward who was given some money from a master and supposed to invest it and make, make it grow. And one of the servants out of the group of them doesn't. He takes it and he buries it. And when he buries it, uh, he, he pulls it back out and he sort of gives it begrudgingly back to the master. He's like, this is yours. This is what belongs to you. And then he says something. He says, I know that you are a hard master. You're a stern master. And the guy, the parable, the point is that that guy got it all wrong. And that guy was punished. He, what he did have was taken away from him. But here's a contrast. Sometimes, sometimes we might think, maybe God would be angry and stay angry at me. Maybe God isn't actually for me. Maybe God loves other people, but how do I know he loves me? 
Well, you need to know it not just in theory. You need to know who God is. You need to know that he is a God that is generous and loving and gracious. And this is what he said to Moses when he passed by Moses. He proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, forgiving sin and transgression and sin. God is gracious and merciful. This isn't just something that once in a while he decides to do. This is who he is. God is a God of justice and he punishes just, justly. That's why Christ died. And the reason that Christ died is also because he is a loving God. He is a forgiving God. He is a gracious God. And that, therefore, gives us confidence. So we get back to Romans 8. This should give us incredible hope. This should give us incredible confidence. Paul is saying, what shall we say in light of all these things? We suffer. And that's real. I mean, we suffer in painful ways. Relationships are broken. Sickness comes into our bodies. You know, uh, pandemics and politics and all these things that happen in this world divide and they tear people apart. I mean, I think it is a terrible, awful thing that so many elderly people in these homes have had to be so isolated for so long. That is a terrible burden. And so we pray for them, but still, it's a hard thing. God says, in light of all these things, this is like childbirth. God is, in fact, for us. Well, another question he asks in the next verse, who will bring any charge against God's elect? There's the question. And the point is, again, it doesn't matter. Why? Because God, the judge of all, is the one who justifies. And then he gets to this. He says, who is to condemn? Who could condemn you? Do you believe in Jesus? You know that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved? And, and he says, who is going to condemn you if you call on the name of Jesus? If you repent and trust in Jesus, he says, Jesus Christ is the one who died. This is something that happened completely outside of you. This is not something that you have done. Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised... Again, you didn't cause any of this to happen. Who is at the right hand of God interceding for us? The question here is this. Who can condemn you? Who can, who can declare that you deserve to be punished and you will be condemned? Who is able to do that? Plenty would like to. Plenty try to. Okay? You might try to condemn yourself. You might say, I can forgive other people. I can't forgive myself. Okay? You know what? Good news. In Christ, it doesn't matter if you condemn yourself. What matters is what God says. What matters is what Jesus did, not what you do. Who else would condemn you? You probably have some enemies. There's probably at least a few people that don't like you. Jesus said, everyone who desires to live a godly life, actually Paul says this to Timothy, Jesus said the same thing to his disciples, will be persecuted. Uh, we're in a culture right now that wants to cancel biblical Christianity. Just this past week, there was a federal class action lawsuit against colleges and universities. And the class action lawsuit introduced this week in a federal court in the, uh, in the Northwest is against um, Christian schools from across the country demanding that federal funding be stopped to schools that do not accept all sexual identities and conduct. So if you have a Christian school and you have a moral code of conduct for your campus, this federal lawsuit wants to hurt Christian schools that receive this. This is how they're coming after biblical Christians. It's happening right now, okay? There is a world that increasingly wants to condemn Christians. 
Well, who's going to condemn? To us, we can look at this and say, this is like the pains of childbirth. Yeah, we can get through this because we know that we will triumph in the end. That's the point. Here's another who will condemn you. The devil. The devil will condemn you, okay? Uh, in the Pilgrim's Progress, Christian is walking through a valley and he starts thinking thoughts. But what happens, what he can't see is he's in such a dark place that someone comes up behind him and starts whispering things, awful, awful things. And Christian, it's so dark that he can't, he can't think, is that my thoughts or is someone saying this to me? And he thinks that he's thinking these things on his own. The devil would condemn you. Thoughts come into your mind. Other people will think awful things of you because the devil is real and at work. He is called the accuser of Christians in Revelation 12. And because of what Jesus has done, he has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before God. The devil would condemn you, but what Jesus has done removes the devil from the equation. There's a picture of this, of a vision that Zechariah the prophet had in Zechariah chapter 3, where there's a high priest in Israel named Joshua. And Joshua the high priest stands before the Lord, but next to him is the devil. And the prophet Zechariah sees this, and he, he's looking on, and, and Joshua, who is supposed to, the high priest, we learned about this this week, must make a sacrifice by being clean and by offering blood. Zechariah is being condemned by the devil for all the filth that is on him. And in the vision, it's literally he's filthy with his garments covered, where he's supposed to represent God's people and to be pure. He's filthy. And the devil is saying, look at him, look at the filth, look at, he deserves to be punished. And God says to the devil, he rebukes him, and then he commands, take the garments off of him, remove them, and put clean garments on him. And then the devil is no, has no longer a basis, and God says, I have taken away your iniquity from you, and I have clothed you with pure vestments. Friends, that is the picture of what God does for every Christian. We have had been covered with guilt, with the filth of our sins, and the devil would accuse us of that. But Jesus, because of what he did, has taken the penalty of all of that. And therefore, God clothes us with pure garments, with the righteousness that is in Christ. So therefore, even though we came filthy, we have been made clean and able to stand before God and will not be condemned, even by the devil. Amazing. Will God condemn you? And here's the point. No way. God is the redeemer. God is the one who loves you. That's the point. The point is that because Jesus died and was raised and is interceding, none who would or could condemn you matter at all. It doesn't matter. See, that's the whole point. In Christ, you are vindicated from all condemnation. It's gone. And that is the one court that matters. People might. The devil wants to. You might even want to condemn yourself. Let me tell you, in Christ, none of that matters. Because the one judge, the one court that matters for you and your eternal reality is the judgment seat of Christ. Is God's judgment. And in Christ, you are vindicated from all of your sin. So you can say that, that chant, that taunt. You can say, where, O oh death, is your victory? You can't win because Jesus has overcome the grave and he overcame it on my behalf. And because he overcame it on my behalf, I now cannot be defeated by sin and death and sin. The devil, all of the works of this fallen, broken world, they can hurt me, they can do their worst, but they will not win. What a God. 
You know, he says three things here that Jesus has done. The cross, the resurrection, and the intercession. Do you see that in verse 34? He says, it's Jesus Christ is the one who died. Look at what Jesus did. We looked at this earlier this week on Thursday night. The one who represented you died. He truly died. And when he died, and when he breathed his last, and they laid him in that tomb, he had absorbed the penalty for your sin. And when he did, he was truly dead. The wages of sin is death, and he took the wages that you deserved. Secondly, he says, but more than that, more than that, he didn't just die, more than that, he was raised. Notice the, the, the grammar here. It's a passive. He was raised. That, that the, the point here is that this is pointing to what the father did. It's like he, he went and he said, you took the full penalty. And the father here is pictured as the one that's raising him up. The father said, I am satisfied with your death. I am, com you have completely paid the penalty for their sins and you will come alive again. And now, and, and, and in his physical body, in his glorified risen body, his, his chest breathed air again. His, I, I don't know exactly how a glorified body works, but in my mind, his, his fingers, you know, they started to twitch and they moved around. And he, somehow he took these garments off and he walked out of the tomb. Friends, he who was dead lives. He walked out of a grave with a big stone rolled in front of it. That's amazing. That is something that changes everything. And because he lives, more than that, who was raised, he says, God is satisfied with his death when he raised him to life. And because he was satisfied with that death and raised him to life again, you are justified. He was put to death for our sins and he was raised for our justification. God says, because Jesus died, you are declared innocent. It's been paid in full. And I have accepted his payment and have raised him to life to prove it. And his death was your death. It's done. And his life is now your life forever. He did it all. God is satisfied with his death. And so this victory over death is your victory over death in him. And so you can stare down the worst that this world can give you. Don't let this fade from your mind, okay? Live for Christ. Keep remembering these things. Let go of anything that holds you back from following Christ fully, for living for him. Repent of all sins and let go of any good thing if it holds you back from knowing Christ and walking with him, he is worth it. And he says, finally, who is at the right hand of God who is interceding for us? Jesus is interceding for us. He is in heaven now. He ascended to be with the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. This is the point. Don't misunderstand what it means that Jesus is interceding for us. We read in Sunday school this morning in John 16 that the Father himself loves you, Jesus says to his disciples, because you have loved me. In other words, all people who have turned to Jesus, who trust in him, are loved by God. We are joined to Christ in union, and we are loved by God, the Father himself. So when you sin now, the intercession of Christ still holds you, but it's not that God the Father gets angry again and again, and Jesus has to keep saying, I, I did die for them, I did die for them, it's okay. That's not the way it works. The Father himself loves you and he is satisfied. The point is that Jesus is interceding for us who trust in him. He is caring for all the details of our lives from heaven right now. He's still connected with us. He is for you. <clears throat> he is with the Father and he's interceding for us. Now the, the, the idea here is it, Hebrews chapter 7 talks about this, that he is a great high priest that he, is, he was tempted and he suffered in every way like we suffer in this world. And therefore, now he is representing us there. 
He can sympathize with everything you experience. And he hasn't left you as an orphan in this world. He sent his spirit. He is, he is intimately aware of everything you experience. Every loneliness. Every, every physical pain. Every, every bit of temptation that you suffer under. He knows about it all. And he knows your needs. He knows your needs for provision. He knows everything that you need in every way, and he is able to provide in genuine, real, concrete ways. Now, the point here is, who will condemn? God has done all this. And these two realities are still true. He loves us, and he's seeing us through to glorification until we would be with him. But it's like a process of childbirth, where there is agony now, there is pain, there is suffering right now. He knows it all. So what's the point? Who will condemn? It doesn't matter. He will see us through. And look at what it says. Does this mean then, the fact that he's interceding for us, he loves us, does this mean that bad things will not happen to us? Well, no. They happen to Jesus and he calls us to take up a cross and follow him. He says it is like childbirth. Jesus himself suffered and he calls us to a narrow way. And, and no one gets out of this sinful, fallen world without any kind of suffering, without some kind of suffering. You do not have ease promised to you. You do have hope. You do and you will have victory because of the love that is in Christ. You see, that's the, the point of these last few verses just amazing verses. I want you to notice that all of the things that are listed here in verse 35 are things that can and do happen to Christians. And that's the point. The point here is not that um, they might happen to you. The point is that they do happen, and they happen to Christians. And so how do we make sense of these things again? Again, the point is God will keep us through all of these things. Listen to this verse, this amazing verse. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? We don't have an easy place where we find ourselves. As it is written... This is specifically for Christians. For your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Is the world hard? Yeah. It's really hard. But you know what we can do? We can look at death itself. We can look beyond all the things just listed here. Every type of suffering. Even violence even famine, every kind of persecution, torture even. Christians experience these things. And we can see past them with real victory. And we can even taunt death itself and the grave. A person should be able to walk up to you as a Christian and say, um, you are defeated. I will kill you. And a Christian should be able to say, do your worst. God will raise me up. I will have victory over the grave. It will not end, even with my death. That's the promise for Christians. He says in verse 37, no, in all these things. Notice that he doesn't say if these things. He says in all these things, we are more than conquerors. It's not us. Look at what he says. Through him who loved us. God's love has orchestrated all this. God loved us so much that he sent Christ to be our redeemer, to die in our place, to live a perfect life of obedience through him who loved us. And then he lands it with this. I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, these powerful things, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything 
else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, if you don't know Christ, two chapters later, this is what it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This day, turn your mind and your heart to Jesus. Turn away from the things of this world. Turn away from the fear of man. Turn away from your sin and find forgiveness and life in Jesus. It will never be taken away from you because his love will hold you and nothing, nothing, not even yourself will be able to separate you from that love. He will hold you and he will see you through until you stand with him on the last day, risen, overcoming the grave, overcoming your sin, overcoming everyone who would condemn. It will all be done and you'll be able to say, where, O death? Where, O death, is your sting? Where is your victory? Jesus has overcome. Fill your mind and your heart with the victory that is for you in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise you. Father, I pray that you will um, establish our minds and our hearts in these truths. Father, anyone who is here, anyone who is listening on the live stream, who doesn't have this confidence, Lord, guide them even now to pray and call on your name to find this life and to have it. Bring them into your kingdom, finally, beginning on this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus Christ is our living hope. Please stand if you're able and sing with us.
Pray with me. Father in heaven, these truths are more glorious than our small minds can yet comprehend. But I ask that you would help each one of us to grasp them truly, even if we cannot yet grasp them fully. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.